This is Inspiring Design, where unique innovators come together to share their knowledge, share their insight, and keep us up to date with the latest industry trends. And here's your host, Rashan Senanayake. What's up, listeners? Welcome to Season 4 of Inspiring Design with Rashan Senanayake. This is where the best of the best brands, experts, change makers, and thought leaders come together to share their valuable insights, experience, and knowledge, all centered around the growth sector in advanced manufacturing within Industry 4.0, encompassing various industries, technologies, skills, knowledge, trends, as well as stakeholders, all the while linking it back into education, within schools and universities. Today, I have here with me a very special guest and close friend, Jules McMurtry. Jules has spent her career finding the sweet spot of collaboration and communication to deliver innovative solutions for human capital, social and economic development. For the past seven years, Jules has used these authentic talents to bridge the gap between schools and industry through the Gateway to Industry Schools program, first for food, then wine and tourism, and now within advanced manufacturing. Jules is literally addicted to these outcomes. GISP for Advanced Manufacturing is proudly hosted by the Queensland Manufacturing Institute, QMI. QMI is a non-for-profit, non-membership-based organization run by manufacturing practitioners for the advanced manufacturing sector. For over 30 years, they've been diffusing technology to industry. QMI bought the first 3D printer to Australia 25 years ago. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. Jules, welcome to Inspiring Design. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So can we start off with a little bit of background on yourself? Just so for the listeners can understand your story and where you're coming from. What's your history? Sure. Um, My name is Jules McMurtry and I manage the Gateway to Industry Schools program now for advanced manufacturing. My background is actually 15 to 20 years in hotels and resorts, um, managing really seven different departments to work together to deliver an experience. Um, It's similar to manufacturing, actually, when you talk about factories and and what it takes to deliver a product. Um, And then I went into economic development um, and use capacity building uh, to provide economic development to small regional communities. I did that for a while and found the nice sweet spot of collaboration and communication and innovation. Um, and then I was lucky enough to uh, manage the Gateway to Industry Schools program for food, wine and tourism for a while there. And, uh, and it wasn't until about three, four, nearly four years ago now that I jumped the fence into manufacturing and have been playing with big makers for the last four years. So Awesome. Hmm. Definitely a wide experience background where you're coming from. So I can see why QMI obviously puts the gateway in charge of you now. There's a there's a mix, uh, something that I wanted to clarify today was firstly understand and show the big picture of how QMI fits into advanced manufacturing and at the same time how does that go alongside with gateway. So firstly who is QMI? Yeah, QMI um, started 27 years ago and was a collaboration between the CSIRO, QUT and government. And um, it was run, it's run by manufacturers for manufacturing. So it's a not-for-profit. Um, it's great to have um, leading manufacturers around the board table that direct and guide where the organisation goes. But basically their tagline was to make new possible for many, many, many years Um, We bought, QMI bought across the first 3D printer to Australia 30 years ago or nearly 30 years ago. That's awesome. And it really is only just now being diffused into industry um, for them to recognise the benefits of additive manufacturing to their business. So we've been playing in a leadership um, make new possible space for a long time and it was really, I was just really blessed to get in with a not-for-profit that has just the greater good in mind, to be honest. Um, So there's a lot of manufacturers now that have benefited from those learnings from QMI over the past 27 years. Mm 
um, whether that be lean uh, or um, capacity building um, or capability pr pr producing um, workshops, quad chart workshops, um, things to get into defence. QMI have uh, various um, sectors to their business. I work in the skills division mm -hmm. um, where we have um, a lot of workforce development trainers and lean trainers. So they go and train industry how to implement lean into their business mm -hmm. um, and lean manufacturing processes are what's assisting manufacturers to transition into what we call industry 4.0, um, which is the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, they also manage um, the ICN, which is the industry capability network and ops, which are supply chain um, parts of the business. Mm -hmm. So assisting government to ensure the buy local components are adhered to by our Queensland manufacturers and um, in the tenders and submissions. Um, so it's to connect the value chain for Queensland manufacturers. So I'm just one little tiny cog in this big wheel that makes mm. new possible for manufacturing, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I love that. There's so many stakeholders coming together. And when you mentioned the word collaborative, that is, it's the, in the true nature, I think. Now, within, uh, within QMI, we have the Gateway to Industry Schools program. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? What is that exactly? And I understand that there's different sectors as well. So just for the clarification for teachers, for schools, the listeners, who is Gateway to the Industries? Yeah, so um, the Gateway to Industry Schools program, let's just call them GISPs. GISPs. So the GISPs, uh, there's actually 10 of us in the state now. We are Queensland Government Department of Employment, Small Business and Training Grants but we're housed or hosted by industry so that we're seen as industry and not constrained by government. Mm -hmm. So um, the, and that we're all very different, managed differently through the different um, host bodies. And QMI has hosted the Gateway to Industry Schools Program for Manufacturing for um, 11 years. So since 20, uh, 2009. Um, and so we're really a small niche um, pot of funding in the big picture for the Queensland Government. Mm -hmm. Desbet, uh, the Department of Employment, Small Business and Training, um, spend around $780,000, oh, sorry, $780 million right. on um, VET investment yep. in vocational training in Queensland. Mm -hmm. We're there to make new possible. We're there to guide and make sure that um, our different industries have a pipeline of talent. Mm -hmm. And because we stay out the front, um, we're usually three to five years ahead of um, schools and where the curriculum and where uh, the majority tipping point is. So that's why we're a niche program. Yeah. It's, a, it's a niche um, bucket of funding that supplies one, maybe one and a half people to cover the state. So in the gateway for manufacturing, which only just recently in 2020 moved to advanced manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, it really is just, uh, so 35 schools are in the gateway. Um, that's all we can handle for one person. Mm -hmm. um, and we really give industry insights and evidence to our schools and connections to make sure that they're embedding and understanding um, the contextualization of STEAM learnings into their curriculums. Yep and ensuring that they've got that industry component to it so they understand why they teach what they teach. Yeah, yeah. No, brilliant. And so I wanna take this conversation now towards that elusive advanced manufacturing sector and industry 4.0. Going back to the epi uh, first episode where Francisco Betty from the World Economic Forum, he defined advanced manufacturing and what industry 4.0 is within a global sector. So that changes from depending on which country you're in, depending on the skills um, and where the economy stands from each country. So bringing it, it down to Queensland, in your words, what is firstly industry 4.0? And then how does that translate to advanced manufacturing? Yeah, well, a tough one. Let's, well, let's say that it's 
it's exciting mm -hmm. and it's exciting opportunity for Queensland and for Australia. Um, industry 4.0 being the fourth industrial revolution, every time there is a revolution, the world changes yeah. dramatically. So The way we work, the way we learn, everything. Everything. So if you think the first industrial revolution was steam, the second one was electricity, the third one, everyone talks about robots and automation taking all the jobs. Mm. That happened in manufacturing in the 70s. Yeah. So we're up to industry industry 4.0, which started about nine years ago in Germany. And it's the digital integration of all parts of the value chain. So it's about connecting a manufacturer or a raw producer to the end user. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where the, the value is. So the manufacturing workforce or industry is diversifying. So no longer is it about just producing a product and pushing it into the marketplace yeah. where manufacturers can adopt research and development and design and connect to their end user, then that's where the value is for a manufacturer. Yeah. Um, Australia is beautifully placed worldwide. Um, we're known for our quality niche customized products and that's what, that's what the world wants. Yeah we can no longer continue to manufacture goods and pretend that our beautiful planet's just going to be able to put up with it. We have to be able to be responsible in understanding where our product's going to end up. Yeah. So that's why you'll see larger manufacturers from Europe already um, want to know where their product's going to end up. So they, they're buying back. IKEA, for example, is buying back their furniture because they don't want their brand associated with landfill. Mm. And it's really important that our manufacturers understand where their product's going to end up. And because of that reason, it's forcing manufacturers to adopt a different business model for the longevity and sustainability of both their business and the planet. Um, and I think this is where SDG goals need to play a bigger role, especially as the designers, students, teachers, the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals need to be integrated. And I think the bigger bigger brands are starting to do that more and more. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. It's um well it's good it's good business. Yeah. It's good business now. So what it is doing though is forcing um manufacturers of larger product mm -hmm. to um go to a servitized model. Uh it doesn't even necessarily have to be larger product. I saw um an endoscopy uh, manufacturer the other day has has gone to an industry 4.0 model. Mm -hmm. So connecting and using technology for traceability. Yeah. Um, so there's 19 different technologies that our manufacturers are adopting. Mm -hmm. um, we are an island, a big island that's yep. 16 weeks away by boat. So that leaves us a competitive advantage mm -hmm. in that um, a lot of these bigger manufacturers, if they're not in Australia currently, they will be here shortly. Yeah. Uh, so that's providing a unique opportunity for Queensland and for Australia mm. um, because we don't do millions of well, but we do quality niche yeah. well. And that's our, that's our advantage. Yeah. Now, those technologies that you mentioned, the 16 different variations, and they're almost different sectors in itself. Can you list them? Oh, I, I probably can't list all of them, to be honest with you, but um, because every business is niche and, and will require different things. Um, but basically it's about, I, I actually reminds me of being in um, tourism 15 years ago when we were trying to teach these little mum and dad B&B businesses how to put their rooms basically their product mm. up onto channel managers that was going to that was going to connect them to their end user which their end user could be anywhere in the world so trying to convince these little small to medium sized enterprises mm. in hospitality and tourism is very similar to looking at the manufacturing sector now they 97% of them would be small to medium sized enterprises mm. so trying to convince them that it's okay, you can put your product up mm. on channel managers and connect to your end user who could be anywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, it's very scary for a lot of manufacturers uh, and a lot of mum and dad businesses. 
but it's necessary to understand um, the global opportunities that are coming with it. Mm. And it's exciting stuff to see them transition and reshore, you know, like, so where they were ordering, you know, 30 billets of steel from overseas, mm. now they're reshoring and ordering, you know, seven niche runs of, of steel from around the corner. So because um, with different te technologies, so it could be 3D point cloud mapping, it could be additive manufacturing, 3D printing, mm. uh, it could be blockchain as a traceability. If you think um, a lot of these major primes, mm. uh, if they've got, so no longer is it necessary for defence or these major primes to be taking all that risk in-house, they're going to be getting 200, say, SMEs capability ready to feed into their value chain. Mm. So, um, and how do they do that? They have to use some traceability technology. And yeah. we've, we've used technology like this for many, many years. It's coming in different forms. The Internet of Things yeah. is another one. I always try and um, teach my teachers and students how to think about the Internet of Things in a simplistic way by just teaching them that the internet was built for people by people. Yeah. The internet of things is the internet for things, so for our machines to talk to each other. And I think that's exactly right because going back to one of the previous episodes, um, Michelle from Telstra talked about IoT and how at the end of the day, how simple it is. It's actually an everyday household technology now. We just don't know it sometimes and it sounds more complicated than what it is. And even things like, you know, we underestimate the smartphone, but the sheer amount of artificial intelligence mm. that's in that big data processing, um, even the augmented reality components with that's built into our everyday phones. Totally. It's becoming more and more mainstream and sometimes we're not even aware of it. I think that's where there's a lot of gap where people don't utilize the skills and the technologies even though it's right in front of our faces. Oh, it's exciting. Virtual reality, augmented reality, yep. the gamification of training and safety, all of that stuff is super exciting. It's de-risking uh, it in schools, you know, to have augmented welding instead of traditional MIG or TIG welding in mm -hmm. schools obviously makes it um, more accessible by a lot more students yep. and schools. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, just thinking of the different technologies, they're not. Um... And that's the thing, like the kids nowadays, they actually are used to these technologies are designed to learn through play. There's no manual anymore. And that scares a lot of people. <laughs> and I find that the generational gap, that's where there's a lot of clash right now students will put on a VR headset or start using their smartphone within minutes and they'll guide other people. And I'm first-hand witness, um, a son and, her f and his father using VR for the first time. And the son within one and a half minutes was in VR, installing his own applications while guiding the dad. 40 seconds into it, the dad gave up yeah. and he took the headset out. So it, it's that it's a different way of, I think, interacting and learning. And the digital natives, they are fully into it. So this is where I wanted to, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, how do these skill sets, when it comes down to advanced manufacturing industry 4.0, what are the key skill sets that are embedded, that need to be embedded in our education system within schools? Um. So QMI run as part of their skills division, a full skills ecosystem that's got everyone from universities, TAFEs, school sectors, and it's got 16 different industries represented around the table. Manufacturing is a big portfolio. So we go from textiles, clothing, footwear, marine, all the way through to aerospace, defense, and even space manufacturing. So it's a huge portfolio and we do make a lot of beautiful things in this country. Um, and they're, but they're all very different. As you can appreciate, the beef producers and the, and the beer brewers mm. don't have the same needs um, as, say, a textile clothing footwear or space manufacturer. 
as far as training packages mm -hmm. and units of competency. Yeah. But what we're after is capability outcomes instead now. Mm -hmm. So I have seen um, these digital natives be able to go into sometimes these mum and dad businesses mm -hmm. that don't have these succession plans and be able to bring the technology skills, these the digital skills that they've learnt in school yeah. and bring them in. But they're also not scared, mm. you know, and that's the difference. Uh, I think with Gen X, for me, definitely Gen X, um, I, it scares me, yeah. some of these technologies. And whilst I talk about them all day, every day, and I play in them and connect the dots to them every day, I'm totally not familiar with them <laughs> and totally uncomfortable with them and do rely on my sons or um, other people, younger people around me to help me with that. So I think definitely what Industry 4.0 and COVID and the new world definitely has pushed us to is understanding that we are all in it together. We're learning together. It's rapidly changing so fast that no one person can know all the answers. And it is, um, so the Queensland Reference Group that sits above my role with all those industry and that's that full skills ecosystem have determined and voted for the past four years mm -hmm. that the three top skills that we're after, besides literacy and numeracy, of course, is um, design thinking, the ability Love to it. problem solve. <laughs> yeah. Um, and generally systems thinking, mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of country kids naturally have this ability mm. to be natural systems thinkers in understanding the bigger picture because yeah. usually mum and dad, if they're running a farm, have got to think about multiple different um, scenarios yeah. all the time. And so those kids are naturally raised like that. Um, Emotional intelligence is a huge one Very, yep. um, and the ability to be able to communicate, cross-pollinate with and teamwork with um, other professions and mm -hmm. trades and people that are going to be able to help you engineer the solution before we go to manufacture. Mm. And um, resilience yep. the ability to get back up um so learning how to fail and if you are going to fail then you fail fast and failure is not an end point it's literally a pit stop and you keep moving forward absolutely yep. whereas um for my generation it was definitely failure and it wasn't fantastic mm. you know whereas for this generation they definitely they've learned that to be to fail is part of success you've yeah. got to fail to get it right if you release it to the market you ideate Test refine it. yep define it keep going roll Perfect. back yeah. yeah so and you know bringing in better design in the process so not just manufacturing as i said for the sake of manufacture mm. it's about and not even um with just waste in mind it's about Closing the loop and understanding the circular economy is a massive growing area in our in our landscape. And it and in Australia we are very fortunate. We're 40% less in research and development knowledge workers here in Australia than we are anywhere else, especially in the US. Mm. So again, that provides um, a, a unique opportunity for Australia. Yep. We really are sitting pretty in this space. It is. And I think this is the beautiful part where we have an opportunity to lead and grow with a very unique context. We've got the land, we've got the skill sets. And like you said there, the thinking behind the natural systems thinkers that are already within our environment just needs to be harnessed alongside the technology. Now, this... if. Just because of my own uh, personal affiliation with design thinking, I want to go into a little bit of detail within that because design thinking, even though it can be categorized as one skill set, it actually builds a, a variable and a myriad of different skills that derive from that. Now, things like creative problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, Innovation is a result of that. So I wanted to clarify that. And did you have any thoughts on how design thinking sits above the rest, but also is a pivotal part about how we move forward in this sector? 
Um, I definitely think with Industry 4.0, what it is doing as well, um, not only is it changing the business models, but it's also um, pushing what would be the traditional hierarchy of power from the factory, from the top of the factory onto the floor. Mm. And in enabling our workforce to be able to cope with that, we need to teach them how to make these um, decisions or provide them a framework. Yeah. They all were already had the knowledge. Yeah. They already um, work in it every day. They know where the problems are. So it's about giving them a system or a framework to mm. be able to um, help themselves. And yeah. so as we get better at adopting technology and transitioning into Industry 4.0 and connecting with our global audience, and that's what technology is allowing us to do. Um, we're not talking about fighting for the same piece of the small pie. We're mm. talking about making the pie exponentially large. And we don't even know what the pie looks like. Yeah. The ingredients are part of it and, and the, keeping this weird analogy going with the, with the, well, with the pie. It's, it's actually, there's so many ingredients that we haven't even built yet. And it could be very different in a year's time. It's so fast. That's the beautiful part, I think. Well, I try not to scare young people <laughs> by saying that. Like I hear sometimes people talk about, oh, well, we're getting you ready for jobs that haven't even been invented yet. Well, to be honest, that's really scary as a young person yeah. coming into the work world of work as it is. Mm. I think we are adding another layer of um, complexity when we add that well, we don't even know where you're going mm. or that. So I think we have got the jobs mm. here now that are innovative and we have got those. Um, and I think if we're concentrating on those core skills of emotional intelligence and being allowed to um, reflect and give feedback mm. and, and provided open um, workplaces where expression is um, able to be valued, different people's point of view. Um, I think you'll find where diversity and whether that be in gender or, or culture or whatever, I think the more diverse our workplace, um, the better we are at being able to innovate and communicate um, or communicate and then be able to collaborate with other areas and be able to innovate to understand these opportunities. Yeah. Um, I think that's the core thing is that if we provide them with the, with the 21st century skills that we're yeah. after, so problem solving and communication and presentation skills and financial literacy and those. There's a whole myriad of them. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, that, um, I think wherever they're embedded, they need to be embedded so yeah. that um, these young people come out with the skills that we're after. And I think the power has shifted as well. Industry has to understand that um, workforce development has to be part of your core business now. Mm. It's no longer just a, um, a way of saying I'm... I need skills and going and, and grabbing them from wherever you can. It's mm. about um, making sure that it's part of your core business and yep. that you're investing in, in your people and, and, and your team and that you've built it into your framework and into your business that they're able to knowledge transfer within the business yep. um, so that you've got that next generation and wave of, of skills that you require. These young people can definitely bring... Um, the digital native and that mindset, mm. which I've seen in some of our manufacturers that have adopted some technologies where you've got 25 year plus tradies, you know, saying, I'm not using that, you know, yep. and having a young person beside them just whack it on and, and show that. them how it is, yeah, how easy it is. I definitely have seen these young people feel so valued going into those types of businesses. Yep. So it really is about manufacturers also taking responsibility um, to understanding what the opportunities are yeah. and grabbing um, some young people and um, don't be afraid. Give them your trust. Um, let them experiment and you never know where they'll take you. Yeah. And I think that's the beautiful part. You mentioned ex experimenting 
and design thinking's three values is empathy, collaboration, and experimentation. So combining that with resiliency and emotional intelligence, it doesn't matter if the jobs actually don't exist. Yeah. It's actually, they, they're prepared for anything. Exactly, yeah. If the technology changes, if it, if it marches ahead of them, all of a sudden a new technology gets introduced. All of it doesn't matter because they're geared for it. So I want to I take this. You've given some valuable advice for industries on how to approach that generational gap. What's your advice for schools? Um, definitely connect wherever you can to your local industry. It's mm. really, um, there's a lot of help out there. It, you can get in touch with um, your local council and see what manufacturers are around you to be able to reverse engineer. And that's what we do when we set up a school. Basically, that's what we do. We look at the multipliers around them or who's going to need what workforce and then reverse engineer it. For example, there's no point in setting up, um, say, marine, a boat, a cert to a boat building in the middle of nowhere, you know, that would be more placed, you know, in those coastal areas. So there's a lot of manufacturers in a lot of nooks and crannies all over this state and, and this country. And I think that's where that going back to the systems thinking, having that big picture vision, just because you like marine, if, if you're not within the coastline, it's not really relevant. So you have to have that bigger vision. So I love I've that. I've been told it's very unschool <laughs> by a number of our principals yeah. when we've done it. Mm -hmm. And we've said, okay, well, your school is around a lot of construction manufacturers or a lot of textile clothing footwear or a lot of different businesses, they've they've usually said, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Because mm. usually it's driven from their personal um, beliefs or what they like to do or maybe perhaps the teacher on staff has got a background in that or could have perhaps had a trade in that. So yeah. they usually go with what the teaching resource has been as opposed to where are these where are these students going to get jobs basically yeah. and reverse engineering it. And so at the moment, because a lot of these manufacturers are reshoring, there's a lot of opportunities. Mm. Um, and so they're all looking for skills. So yeah. it's definitely a, a massive employment sector mm. and it will be, you know, for many, many years to come. I think that's news to a, uh, music to a lot of people because of that worry about it, autonomy and these different technologies replacing jobs and the, and the jobs as we know it are getting replaced and, and they're technically lost or made redundant. So that's good news for everyone. Now, on that same token, the other side of the coin is the schools are your students. So what's your advice for students? Students, well, I usually look after the teachers because I figure if I look after the teachers, then they'll pass the yep. inspiration on to our students. Um, so, and we do that in lots of different ways mm -hmm. through participation and professional development for the teachers, but then they can engage, um, with the industry partners directly. And thanks to COVID, um, schools have adopted a lot of technology to be able to remote learn. So that's always, um, helpful to being able to connect industry as well. So now our industry partners can dial in from their factories mm. straight into a classroom and be able to answer live That's questions. Yeah. So a lot of teachers have gone from school, high school, university, and then back into school. So mm. they really don't understand how um, STEAM is, or science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths is connected to the manufacturing sector. Yeah. So we do a lot of STEAM tours into industry to show them those contextualizations to their teachings. Yeah. Um, students then can go and do the same tour with their teachers uh, or, as I said, industry can dial into their classrooms. Mm -hmm. My um, first piece of advice for all our students is don't panic for a start. It's all it's all fine. <laughs> they get they <laughs> tend to get so wound up. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure on them to go to university. Honestly, 98% of my manufacturing industry partners, if a young person committed to a trade pathway with them, they would actually pay for them to go back to university then mm -hmm. to do engineering, mechatronics, robotics, or any of the other degree qualifications over the top. So um, young people don't have to get a hex debt if they don't if they don't want to. I know that mm -hmm. that's 
contrary to what <laughs> to what parents believe, but we really try and get that message through to the parents that we have all different types of roles in manufacturing from entry level positions all the way up to PhD. Mm. Um, so my advice is, you know, if you take an opportunity, if you see it, take it. Yep. You never know where it's going to uh, head or land you. Um, I also suggest and recommend for young people to find something that inspires them mm -hmm. first and then reverse engineer it how you can get involved. So if your thing is F1 cars, if your thing is F-35 strike fighters or or land 400 boxes or all yeah. of the different types of products that we make here, mm. then find what gives you joy and then reverse engineer how you can get in there. Yeah. You know, there's lots of different roles within these businesses. So if it's marketing, you can go to marketing. Mm. If it's human resources, you can go to human resources. If you're great with figures, but you love cars, then go and do accountancy in a car, in a, in a car um, componentry manufacturer. Or So there's plenty of ways um, to find work. The world of work is always going to be here and there's plenty of jobs in it. I've never met anyone who's been out of work really if they show initiative and they go and volunteer or um, take risks right to um, the CEO, show them you're keen to get into their business. I don't think there's an adult anywhere near me that mm. if a young person came up to them and said, could you help me? Mm. I really, really would like to work in your business, mm. that they would ignore them. I really have never seen that happen. Yeah. Um, and especially if they offered a volunteer or spend their holidays um, or after school hours learning more about their business, no one's ever going to reject that kind of initiative mm. out of a young person. Yeah. So, yeah, take the plunge. Yeah. There's plenty of ops. Valuable advice. No, I love that. And, and um, so from this point with the building on the advice that you've given, how can teachers or schools reach out to you and learn more about either whether that's advanced manufacturing, whether that's industry 4.0 or GISP, anything like that? How can they reach out to you? Um, so if you look up QMI, the Queensland Manufacturing Institute, there's um, some links on our website that will bring you through to the gateway. We've got gateway to industryschools.com.au, which is our resources site for our teachers, but there's a number of um, different things that are available to anybody there. Um, even the Department of Manufacturing has uh, got a lot of information on their website. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre has an academy. Yeah. So there's lots of different avenues for you to get um, some knowledge in this area. But basically, if you love making things, that's manufacturing. Yeah. If you love problem solving, that's engineering. So head towards um, manufacturing and engineering if you've got any of those traits. Uh, we also um, use TAFE has a... a a tool called the Harrison tool. It's a profiling, behavioral profiling tool that our year nines use. Mm -hmm. um, we encourage them to do that process only because it will then help them with their subject selection yep. in making sure that they're heading in the right direction. So we've got um, lots of different roles that are on that TAFE Harrison tool. Um, so that will just be able to give a young person a bit of guidance where that um, where they should be heading. Awesome, valuable advice, guys. Get let's get straight on to that. But Jules, thank you so much for your time. I have personally learned a lot of takeaways about GISP, QMI, advanced manufacturing, industry 4.0, how the world's going to look like, how Queensland's going to look like in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. So thank you so much for giving Pleasure. up your time. That's it for today's episode. Now it's time to take action and build on the learnings to get inspired. First up, jump on to rashansenanayaka.com forward slash podcast and check out the show notes, links and other relevant learning materials from this amazing episode. Next, if you learned something new today, click that subscribe button and set yourself up to receive live notifications on future episodes, as well as more opportunities to learn from our amazing guests, brands and speakers. Last but not least, it's time to have your say. 
Join the conversation and share your thoughts and feedback on today's episode with a review, all while joining many others with a five-star rating for Inspiring Design with Rashan Senanayaka. Till next time.